To be honest, I think that talking about the size and position of the sun on a flat Earth has become pretty trite. Well, I suppose this is the case for most flat Earth arguments, but there is something about the flat Earth sun which hasn't really been discussed much. And in this video, we will do some thought experiments around what we would expect to see if the Earth were flat, and maybe this might inject some new things into the flat Earth discussion. Now, we will start with outlining some basic assumptions. Now, first is that the Earth is a flat disk with a radius of approximately 20,000 kilometers, and the Sun is small and local, and there's a dome surrounding the atmosphere, as the flat Earth community asserts. The second is that the inverse square law is correct, something that, as far as I can see, is not controversial in the whole flat Earth discussion. And that question then becomes, what would the Earth look like? Now, first thing we want to do is measure the height of the Sun. Now, we can do this with Eratosthenes' experiments, and uh, we find that the Sun has an altitude of approximately 5,000 kilometers if you measure it in certain locations at certain times. But this is a readily accepted value within the flat Earth community. Now, I mentioned the inverse square law, and I will go through this in a little bit, and in a little bit more detail than you would regularly find uh, on the internet. Now, the inverse square law merely states that the brightness of an object falls off with the distance according to 1 over the distance squared, and where this comes from is as follows. We take a point source of light which radiates light isotropically. We then take a spherical shell and enclose the light source completely. The total amount of power that hits the surface has some value. Now, now, if we increase the radius of the shell, we see that the total power hitting our new surface is still the same, and this comes from conservation laws in physics. Flux density is measured as the amount of power that hits a unit area, so now we imagine that we place a spherical shell around the sun at some distance. The solar flux density at this shell is given by the total power hitting this shell divided by the surface area. Now, if we increase the radius of the shell, then this surface area increases, but the total power remains the same, and the result is that the solar flux density decreases. Now, this is pretty intuitive. So if we can measure the solar flux density at some distance from the sun, we can figure out the total power output of the sun, and we call this power output P. And then we can calculate the flux density at any arbitrary position by dividing this power output by the surface area of a sphere with a radius equal to the distance to the sun. And we use the expression for solar flux density, which is phi is equal to P over 4 pi r squared. For reference, the following calculations take a conservative value of flux density at 1 kilowatt per meter squared when the sun is directly overhead and the aforementioned height of the sun is 5,000 kilometers. And this allows us to calculate the solar flux at noon on a given day as is shown in this plot. This graph is a slice of the Earth with the North Pole in the middle and the Antarctic on the extremes. The top graph shows a flat Earth and the bottom shows a spherical Earth. The line is taken along the Greenwich meridian at noon on the equinox, so we have the zero degrees line of longitude on the right hand side of the graph and the 180 degree line of longitude on the left hand side of the graph. The first thing that stands out is that at this instant in time, both the Arctic and the Antarctic on the right hand side receive approximately the same amount of light, but we see that the entire Arctic Circle receives sunlight rather than half of it. Remember, that is important on the equinox. When we are on the equator on the opposite half of the disk, there is still sufficient sunlight to actually comfortably read a book. This just considers a snapshot in time though, and this is specific to the Greenwich Meridian at noon on the equinox, so let's have a look at how this develops during the day, and we can run this animation from midnight to midnight. Note that the times are shown in GMT and are not adjusted for daylight savings. And we can also do this for the summer solstice. And for the winter solstice. But I suppose at this point we haven't really figured out anything new. It is not much of a revelation to conclude that sunsets are not possible on a flat earth and nowhere would experience proper night. 
So I'll move to a different animation where we show the solar flux density across the surface of the Earth. On the top row, we see the case of a flat Earth and the bottom shows the case for a spherical Earth. The left column shows the calculation on the AE projection and the right column shows the Mercator projection. I've also plotted a rough map on it. Now the yellow regions are regions of high solar flux density and the red regions show areas with low flux density. And when the map is grey, the solar flux density is zero and therefore it is night. So here we have an animation which shows how the solar flux density develops through the day. First on the equinox, now on the summer solstice, and on the winter solstice. And this is another way of demonstrating what we saw when we just looked at the slices on a flat earth. Uh, it is never night. However, on the globe, we see that exactly half of the surface is lit up and the other half sees night. Again, nothing I've shown here is particularly surprising, but I showed this purely to get you familiar with these plots. So far, we have looked at instances in time over a single day. But now we will start looking at the average over a single day and then over a whole year. At this point, it really gets interesting. Now, on these plots, I've done something a little bit different. Uh, we still have the two rows with the top representing a flat Earth and the bottom representing a spherical Earth. From left to right, the columns represent the average flux density on the AE map average flux density plotted on a Mercator projection, and the average flux density along a line of longitude. So we have a flux density on the x-axis and latitude on the y-axis. Yes, in, it is a bit naughty to put your independent variable on the y-axis, but in this case, it is, um, it is justified. Each frame on the following animation will show the average flux density on the corresponding day. We will start with the autumn equinox and move through the year. I will run through the whole year first and then we'll go back to stop at different frames. So let's start with the equinox. On a globe, we see a nice symmetric function of solar flux density about the equator where it is maximum and it falls off to zero at the poles. But when we look at a flat Earth, we see an asymmetric distribution. We have a peak just north of the equator which falls off in intensity as you approach the Antarctic. However, going north from the peak, we see the flux density falling off as well, but not as rapidly as we see when going south. During the equinox, the North Pole receives an average of around 200 watts per square meter, and the South Pole receives an average of around 75 watts per square meter. Note that in reality, both should receive zero, but on a flat Earth, the light would still be bright enough in both locations to go about your day without the need for artificial lighting. But let's progress to the winter solstice for the northern hemisphere. We see that in the case of a spherical Earth, the peak of our function shifts to the right, but there's another blip forming at the Antarctic Circle. And this is by virtue of the fact that we are looking at averages. Even though the Antarctic Circle receives less light radiation at any given instant, the average is much higher because it is never night. What is promising for the flat Earth model is that the peak in a radiance has shifted slightly, so it is now below the equator, even though we see that the flux density difference between the Antarctic and the Arctic has decreased a bit. The Arctic still receives more light than the Antarctic, even though it is winter in the northern hemisphere. But we'll go straight through to the summer solstice as we've already seen the equinox. On a spherical Earth, we see the reverse of what we saw for the winter, but on a flat Earth, we see that the difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic increases. On the next animation, we have two plots that were previously on the right-hand side column, but this time oriented correctly and with some annotations. I have taken a slice along a line of longitude, so we have 90 degrees north on the left and 90 degrees south on the right. As both the spherical Earth and the flat Earth have radial symmetry, what we show here holds true for all lines of longitude. Now I have shaded the Arctic Circle, the Tropics and the Antarctic Circle, along with the latitude of some notable places for your reference. 
Again, we start with the equinox in the northern autumn. We have the symmetric distribution about the equator, again, we're on the spherical Earth, but we observe the asymmetry in the case of a flat Earth. Now, on a flat Earth, the average flux is highest a few degrees north of Phuket, and it falls off to about 80% of that when we get to the North Pole. It falls off more when we get to the South Pole, but there's still a decent amount of light. And in this section, I'll be talking about the flat Earth graph. The spherical Earth graph on the right is mainly for reference. When we reach the end of October, Greenwich receives the same amount of solar power as Sydney. Just to point out the obvious, in real life, October in Britain is pretty miserable and it's starting to get cold. In Australia, it is usually pretty nice around this time. But when we fast forward to 17th of February, Greenwich is once again getting the same average flux density as Sydney. Just to emphasize this point, February in Australia is really fucking hot. In Britain, we're still talking about the possibility of snow. In southern Canada, which is approximately on the same line of latitude, it's fucking freezing. Now I will now run this on to the summer solstice. And here we see that solar flux density at Sydney is the lowest for the year at around 140 watts per square meter. Um, on a flat Earth or on a spherical Earth, it's roughly the same. So this makes sense at this point. But let's rewind to the winter solstice. We see that the solar flux density at the North Pole during the northern winter is roughly the same. I will now let this animation run to the end. I will now pull up the averages over the entire year. Now, an important part to consider is the impact of seasons. On the plot, you will see dashed lines for the average flux at the summer and winter solstices in the northern hemisphere, where cyan is the northern summer and magenta is the northern winter. On the right-hand side, we have the spherical Earth case, where we see a nice symmetric distribution again. This distribution shows what we expect and measure on a spherical Earth. It also roughly follows the temperature with latitude. The poles are cold and the equator is warm. Now we see that the seasons also create a large range in the values and this range increases as we move towards the poles. But on the left hand side we have the case for a flat earth and here the south pole is cold but the north pole is comparatively pretty toasty. The northern part of the tropics is the warmest but it drops off quite quickly as you go south. Now according to this Australia should not be as warm as it really is. But when we consider the seasons, we also see that the range in values is very large in the northern hemisphere, but very small in the southern hemisphere. The north would experience very distinct seasons, but the south, not so much. And just to finish this off, we have to take a quick look at the maps. I'll briefly touch on some of the limitations of this little thought experiment. And what is shown here is only really a guideline. Solar flux density is the main contributor to the temperature. However, there are many other factors to consider. This is why I only refer to solar flux density and only use this as a rough approximation for temperature. There are a few things I left out um, because there are difficulties in including these in the model. One of the big things is the Beers-Lambert law, which describes the attenuation of power due to the atmosphere. Now, on a spherical Earth, this attenuation uh, has a marginal impact on the function shown in the graph. At least, the impact does not go very far beyond scaling the function uniformly. The reason I didn't include it is because it is difficult to calculate for the flat Earth, as the effect will be much less uniform. However, the effect will be most pronounced at the Antarctic and would increase the in internal inconsistencies of the flat Earth model. Uh, this is because the case of a flat Earth model, the Sun will always be closer to all points on the Arctic. The greenhouse effect was not included as it is a complex topic. The flux density calculations in lieu of an atmosphere would uh, make the Earth a pretty cold place regardless of whether it's flat or spherical. The greenhouse effect uniformly raises the temperature uh, that you would see in both cases. However, on a flat Earth, we have a dome, and unless this dome is a very good heat sink, it would act as an insulator. Now, there are large weather systems around the globe which mediate temperature as well. We have hurricanes, jet streams, along with wind and ocean currents, which regulate temperature. Firstly, hurricanes and jet streams are formed in part 
due to the Coriolis effect. And this would not happen on a flat Earth as there is no rotation to create that Coriolis force. To speculate as to what weather systems would look like on a flat Earth is pretty pointless. Perhaps there are some meteorologists out there who would be up for having a discussion on this topic and contribute to some more thought experiments which could include these atmospheric effects. But with these limitations in mind, the thought experiment does show some interesting results. If the Earth were flat, we'll ignore the obvious lack of night and close off with a look at the graphs again. Now, throughout the year, the Arctic Circle receives more power from the Sun than Australia. The solar power at the Arctic is nearly as high as it is at the equator. The Northern Hemisphere receives more solar power than the Southern Hemisphere, and the values in the Northern Hemisphere have a larger range over the year. Seasons would be more distinct in the North than they would be in the South. And the Antarctic is significantly colder than the Arctic. There are some obvious implications of this. Uh, the southern hemisphere would be colder than the northern hemisphere, and although the coldest region would still be the Antarctic, the constant power input without darkness would make it unlikely that ice caps would exist. Now, the annual average solar power received by the Arctic on the flat Earth is roughly the same as the average solar power in the south of France on the spherical Earth. Considering that a polar night can also not happen, on a flat Earth, thick ice caps are impossible at the North Pole on a flat Earth. Now what I have presented here only scratches the surface of what a flat Earth would look like, and this is only the beginning. I would like to open up a discussion on this topic as I feel that it could be an interesting hypothetical to explore, and I will post the main graphs on my Patreon, and these will be accessible to non-patrons as well, and I will open up a channel on the Discord where the sidewalk ends for anyone who wishes to join in the discussion and explore this topic. Alternatively, you can catch me on Twitter, but I feel that Discord will be more conducive to a good discussion on this topic, and all the links will be in the description. I would just like to thank my patrons, Dr. Thomas Miller, Kevin Dedman, MC Toon, and Stringer News One for their support. It really makes a big difference and it allows me to focus on creating more content like this.